Hello everyone, my name is Kevin Choi and today I would like to explain to you guys what about the comprehensive guide to ethical conduct, funding and budgeting. To first to start us off, I would like to introduce who I am. My name is Kevin Choi. I'm a 12th grader at St. John's School in Guam and I'm also a regional ISAF finalist in 2024. My project is about the auditory effect of Fibonacci and Luca sequences on short-term memory. And I was able to represent Guam as a regional ISAF finalist. Upon other than my participation in regional ISAF, I'm also a math enthusiast as I also participated in the Ross Mathematics program in 2023 as a scholar and 2024 as a junior counselor. So the applications of moral principles to ensure well, the well-being of participants and the integrity of the research process is like the most conventional way to define what research ethics are. And the most important things he, in when we do research ethics includes protection of participants, for example, safeguarding the rights, dignity, privacy of those people, also having integrity of the research, ensuring that whatever we found as in our research is something that is credible. And adding on to that, we need to like build the confidence in the research outcomes among the general public. So just because that you're sure about the research, that doesn't mean that everyone's going to believe what you're going to say, unless you provide like an ethical guideline for your research and also supporting it with the right evidences. Now I'll like talk about the impact of ethical research practices. So some of the most important things here is, for instance, the human rights protection. And for this one, I'll also like to come and connect this back to project. So in my project, I had to get some of the consent forms for some of the participants that from my experiment. And what I ended up doing is that I gave, I had to give them the informed consent form and to make sure that they are not exposed to any harm. They're just listening to some kind of simple music while taking a short-term memory test. And I also had to get a qualified scientist form, which is also one of the most important thing. Since I'm not an expert in fields of medicine, I need to get a something that's 100% sure from like a medical official. And adding upon that, some of the most important things include like scientific validity, which is for instance like the ethical research that minimizes bias and errors, which also leads to reliable and reproducible results. Now, and what happens if we don't do of the ethical research practices? The biggest problems here that might happen, that's the worst case scenario here, is the legal repercussions by adhering to the ethical guidelines. So for example, if you used like one of the persons as a test subject, but you did you didn't get like the correct consent, then the other person still has the right to accuse you legally. And we don't all want that to happen. So that's why we need to make the informed consent form as specific and as great as possible. So now moving on towards the key ethical guidelines. So here what I have on the right is the regional STS IRB form. So there's also one for ISF, but I just put up the STS one because it looks a little bit more cleaner. So there's many different levels of STS IRB. So there is something called a faculty, like university level IRB, and there's also like a school IRB. It really depends like where you are and like what situations you are. And IRBs are important because it rolls in reviewing, approaching research proposals to ensure the ethical compliance. And another thing I'll like talk about is that with the IRB, this ensures the privacy and data of the participants. It's like a contract between you and then the scientific review board. Now I want to address to some of the ethical challenges here. So for instance, the informed consent is that some participants may not fully understand the research or the roles in it. And my idea here is to use simple and clear language and ensure voluntary participation to our experiments. So for me, for one of my for my project for ISEF, many students were not understanding what the game was about. So in result, what I did was that I was I had to explain what the experiment is about and everything repeatedly and repeatedly until they understood. 
And in some cases, there's some risk that some data could be disclosed for some reason. So what I always put in my informed consent form is that after all the experiment and all the competition is done, all these paper will be shredded to get rid of the evidence. And this also shows strong data protection measures and also brings a foundation upon anonymizing data. And other things, the most important thing I would like to say here today is the plagiarism issue. So plagiarism is it's like the biggest red flag when we do research. And it's like the biggest red flag when it comes to research ethics too. And one of the biggest plagiarisms that people do, for instance, is to fail to properly credit others' work or just replicate their work without any acknowledgement. So this is something like robbery or like what a thief does. So when, for instance, when the original researcher was like gaining a lot of like research findings, which could be analogous to what some people try to gain a lot of money, right? But plagiarism is something like just like taking those money from them. And that's, that's the same thing as stealing. And sometimes this could be very done without any notice or any intentions. So what's the most important thing to do here is to use plagiarism detection tools and ensure proper citation practices. Today, there are many different AIs that people use that causes problems with plagiarism. But that also means that there's just so many AI detecting tools that detects plagiarism. And now I would like to move on towards funding. And here to find some types of funding sources, there are many different grants, but I'd like to divide into mainly two. The first grant is the government grant, which includes, includes like NIH, the National Institute of Health, and NSF, which is the National Science Foundation. While for the institutional fund, it's more like the university grants or fellowships. And it, and this for this one, it really depends like where you live on on the US or even from your territory because as a person who is from the territory, the only university that really has these kind of funds is the University of Guam, which has like much less capital compared to like let's say like Columbia University in New York. And another really important thing is to identify suitable funding. So for example, if I'm doing a project on mathematics, but I ask to get government grant from National Institute of Health, some things after, right? They don't go together, the pure math and like the pure biology. So what's important here is to ensure the funders' priorities match your research objectives. And also we need to verify if we can like at least meet the criteria for the grant or you're just like wasting your time. And also there are many different things that we have to also consider while doing the research funding and then the most important thing I want to talk about is the imagined conflicts of interest. So some of the problems could be like funders, since they take a huge part of your experiment, they can influence your research outcomes. But you need to make a clear difference between funding and like actually mentoring. These people who are funding you shouldn't be the ones that mentor you because this is your own project. So you need to maintain independence by clearly separating funding from those research conclusions and how those want. You need to go in the way that you want your experiment to be, not the people who fund yours. Some of the last things I like to talk about is to develop a research budget. So always I would like to give an advice to have, have a more greater Expect a greater expense than like what you originally calculated from everything, including like personal cost, equipment supplies, or or like much more, right? And then the problem here is that just in case, for example, if you're doing like a chemistry experiment, but one of your beaker breaks, you have to buy a new one, right? And in that case, there's a unforeseen expenses that you did not expect throughout the experiment. So just in case for those, you also need to have the estimate cost say higher than what you 
originally like expected from all those like personal costs and like equipments and everything. And another important thing is to effectively manage those resources and also have a nice timeline. So one example of timeline that many people utilize here is to visualize project phases and deadlines. And if if the deadline seems too tight, another important thing is instead of just procrastinating, adjusting the timeline. Don't get like too flexible about it, but try to reallocate time or resources as needed, which is which is one thing that is really important. And yeah, I think that will be it for the experiment for my presentation. And my name is Kevin Choi, and thank you so much. For